Hi, this is Stu Schwartz of MasterMathMentor.com. This is video AB03, and the topic is Average and Instantaneous Rates of Change. It covers the AB manual from pages 7 through 11. We are given a curve, f of x. We have two points on the curve, p and q. We draw a line between those two points. We'll call that line the secant line through P and Q. The slope of this line will be called the average rate of change of F. We have the same setup as we had in diagram 1, but now we draw a line that touches F of X at only point P. We'll call that line the tangent line through P. The slope of this line will then be called the instantaneous rate of change of f. Calculus is the study of change. So let's let the value of q change, and q will now move along the curve f of x closer to p. As q gets closer to p, the secant line changes. The closer the q gets to p, the more the secant line starts to look like the tangent line at p, and so the average rate of change gets close to the instantaneous rate of change at p. So summing up, we will say that as q gets closer and closer to p, then the secant line pq gets closer and closer to the tangent line through p. And so the slope of the secant line, which we will call m seek, will approach the slope of the tangent line at p called m tan. So as q gets close to p, the instantaneous rate of change at p is very close to the average rate of change between p and q. Let's look at an example. Let's let f of x equal x squared, a parabola. We want to find the slope of the secant line, which we know is the average rate of change between x is equal to 1 and given values of x in the table. So think about the p value in the example above being x equals 1 and our q values being the values 2, 1.5, 1.1, where q starts getting closer and closer to 1. Our p-value is x equals 1, and at x equals 1, y equals 1. So we have the fixed point 1, 1. Now, the q-values, our first q-value is 2, and f of 2 is 4. So we figure out the slope of the secant line which is rise over run. The rise is 3, the run is 1, and therefore the slope of the secant line is 3. We do this for the values of x being 1.5, 1.1, 1.05, 1.01, and 1.001. We get extreme accuracy, and what we find is that the slope of the secant line keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and at x is equal to 1.001, the slope of the secant line is 2.001. We are interested, though, in the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 1. By this we mean that q actually arrives at p. There are no longer two points, there's only one point. So as x goes from 1 to 1, f of x also goes from 1 to 1. Therefore, the rise is 0 and the run is 0. The slope, therefore, is 0 over 0, which we know is an error. So we cannot find the slope of the tangent line this way. But by the argument above, the instantaneous rate of change 
of f at x is equal to 1 should be very close to the slope of the secant line, which we know is the average rate of change between x is equal to 1 and a point very, very close to 1. And as we see, as the uh, values of x get closer and closer to 1, the slope of the secant line appears to be getting closer to 2. So the instantaneous rate of change of f at x is equal to 1 would appear to be 2. Let's look at an analogy. Suppose you leave home at 10 a.m. on a driving trip and you arrive at your destination at 12 noon. The trip is a total of 100 miles. I want to know how fast you are going at 11 a.m. We have absolutely no clue what our actual velocity is at 11 a.m. This is called the instantaneous velocity. We can find the average velocity between 10 a.m. and any other time because we know that the average velocity equals the total distance over the total time. So for our trip, our average velocity is 50 miles an hour. But how fast we're going at 11 a.m. is open to question. We could be traveling at 60 miles an hour. We could also be stopped. We have no idea. In the table shown, we see times after 11 a.m. We also take a look at the distance traveled within that time interval, and we then break it down into hours. We calculate the average velocity between 11 a.m. and that time, and also ask for the instantaneous velocity at 11 a.m. So at 11.30, we have traveled a distance of 24 miles, and we traveled one half of an hour. So the average velocity is 48 miles an hour. However, we still have no idea how fast we're traveling at 11 a.m. Between 11 and 11.15, we travel 13 miles. That's a quarter of an hour, which means that the average velocity was 52 miles an hour. However, we still do not know how fast we're traveling at 11 a.m. It's possible that we were traveling at 60 miles an hour. It's also possible that we were stopped. We still don't know. Let's look at between 11 and 11 a.m. and 11.01. We traveled 0 0.8 miles, and that is in 1 60th of an hour. So our average velocity was 48 miles an hour. How fast are we going at 11 a.m.? We don't know. However, it is unlikely that we were stopped. If we were stopped at 11 a.m., we would have to be traveling a heck of a lot faster than 48 miles an hour to cover that distance in one minute. So now, while we don't know how fast we're traveling at 11 a.m., we have an idea that it can't be zero. Let's now look at between 11 a.m. and 11 o'clock and one second. We traveled 80 feet in one 3,600th of an hour. That gives an average velocity of 54.5 miles per hour in that one second time. How fast are we going at 11 a.m.? Well, we still do not know. However, it is, seems to be very likely that we must have been going somewhere around 54.5 miles an hour. There just isn't enough time for there be to be large discrepancies to get the instantaneous velocity at 11 a.m. Now we want the instantaneous velocity at 11 a.m. However, this technique fails us because between 11 o'clock and 11 o'clock we travel zero feet. 
we take zero hours, and therefore the average velocity is zero over zero, which is undefined. And yet, we know that we are moving, so the instantaneous velocity must exist. So, as the time duration after 11 o'clock becomes very small, the instantaneous velocity at 11 a.m is much more likely to be close to 54.5 miles per hour. So, as the instantaneous rate of change of a function at point P is close to the average rate of change of the function between those points P and Q that are very close to each other, by analogy, the instantaneous velocity at some time T it has to be very close to the average velocity between t and another time very close to t. Let's apply the argument we used on the first slide and assign some variables. We have the point p, which we will label as x0, y0, and the point q, on f of x, which is the point x1, y1. We then draw the right triangle underneath the line PQ, and that represents the slope of the line, with the rise as y sub 1 minus y sub 0, and the run being x sub 1 minus x sub 0. Now follow the logic of the next set of steps. We have point P, which is x sub 0, y sub 0, and point Q, which is x sub 1, y sub 1. We then look at the secant line and find its slope, which we know is rise over run, which is y sub 1 minus y sub 0 over x sub 1 minus x sub 0. But since y can be written as f of x, we can say that the slope of the secant line is f of x sub 1 minus f of x sub 0 over x sub 1 minus x sub 0. Now, we know that h represents the horizontal distance between points p and q, which is x sub 1 minus x sub 0. So, rearranging the terms, we get x sub 1 equals x sub 0 plus h. So, finally, we can write the slope of the secant line is f of x sub 0 plus h minus f of x sub 0 all over h. So, here is the important step. We showed previously that the tangent line at point P is defined as the secant line between P and Q. And as Q gets closer and closer to P, x sub 1 gets closer and closer to x sub 0. So h, which we know is the horizontal distance between P and Q, is getting close to 0. So this gives us the starting point for differential calculus. The slope of the tangent line will equal f of x0 plus h minus f of x sub 0 all over h as h gets infinitely close to 0. Now h cannot actually equal 0 because if it does, we have division by 0. So we're interested in what happens as h gets closer and closer, infinitely close to zero. So there are three formulas you need to commit to memory. First, the average rate of change between the points x sub 0, f of x sub 0, and x sub 1, f of x sub 1. This we know to be the slope of the secant line, which is our familiar f of x sub 1 minus f of x sub 0 over x sub 1 minus x sub 0. The second is a calculus formula, which represents the instantaneous rate of change at the point x sub 0, f of x sub 0. This we know to be the slope of the tangent line at the point x sub 0, y sub 0, and that is f of x sub 0 plus h 
minus f of x sub 0 all over h as h gets infinitely close to 0. Finally, our familiar point-slope equation of a line passing through the point x sub 0, f of x sub 0. And this is y minus y sub 0 is equal to m x minus x sub 0. Let's look at three sample problems from pages 9 and 10. First, number 1. We're given the curve f of x equals x squared plus 1, and we'd like to do three things. First, find the slope of the secant line between x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 3. Second, find the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 2. And fi finally, find the equation of the tangent line to the curve at x is equal to 2. We will use the three formulas from the previous page. Although not necessary to the problem, we graph the function below just to get a sense of it. We can see that it's a parabola. We want to find the slope of the secant line between x is equal to 1 and x is equal to 3, so we use our slope secant line formula, and we get f of 3 minus f of 1 over 3 minus 1. This gives 10 minus 2 over 2, and the slope of the secant line turns out to be 4. We next want to find the slope of the tangent line to the curve at x is equal to 2. Using our formula, we get f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 all over h. That gives us 2 plus h quantity squared plus 1 minus f of 2, which is 5, all over h. Doing the algebra, we get 4 plus 4h plus h squared plus 1 minus 5 all over h. Note how the 4 and the negative 4 cancel out. This will usually happen in this type of problem, allowing us an expression which is factorable upstairs. So we get h times 4 plus h over h. The h's cancel, and now we're interested in the expression 4 plus h as h gets very close to 0. At this point, you can allow h to be 0, and you get that the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 2 is equal to 4. Finally, we want the equation of the tangent line at x is equal to 2. We use our point-slope formula. We know that the point is 2, 5. And from part b, we know that the slope of the tangent line is 4. So we get y minus 5 equals 4 quantity x minus 2, and y equals 4x minus 3. We use our calculator to confirm our answer. And notice how it appears, the tangent line appears to be tangent to the curve at x is equal to 2. Example 3a uses f of x equals x squared plus 4x minus 1. To find the slope of the secant line between x equals negative 1 and x equals negative 3, we look at f of negative 1 minus f of negative 3 over negative 1 minus negative 3, which is negative 1 plus 3. We get negative 4 minus negative 4 all over 2, and the slope of our secant line is equal to 0. To find the slope of the tangent line to the curve at x equals negative 2, we look at f of negative 2 plus h minus f of negative 2 all over h. Negative 2 plus h is the same thing as h minus 2, so we plug h minus 2 into our expression and subtract f of negative 2 and put that all over h. When all the expansion is done, we get h squared over h, and that's equal to h. So the slope of the tangent line as h gets close to 0 is equal to 0. Note that we have to do that cancellation before we let h equal to 0. If we didn't, we would have division by 0, which we cannot have. Finally, we want the equation of the tangent line to the curve at x equals negative 2. 
So we have our point, negative 2, negative 5, and we have our slope, which is 0. So when we plug into our point-slope formula, we end up getting y equals negative 5. We see on the curve y equals negative 5 is a horizontal line, and of course we know that horizontal lines have slopes of 0. Let's look at one where the algebra is a little bit more difficult. We have f of x equals 2 over x plus 1, and we want the slope of the secant line between x equals 1 and x is equal to 4. So f of 4 minus f of 1 over 4 minus 1 is equal to 2 fifths minus 1 over 3. We need to multiply both top and bottom by 5, and we end up getting an answer of negative 1 fifth for the slope of the secant line. We next want the slope of the tangent line at x is equal to 2. So we look at f of 2 plus h minus f of 2 over h. And this gives us a complex fraction, 2 over 3 plus h minus 2 thirds all over h. The best way of clearing a complex fraction is multiplying by the LCD, which is 3 times 3 plus h over itself. When we do that, and do all the uh, cancellation, we get negative 2h over 3h times the quantity 3 plus h. As we expect, the h's cancel, and we're left with negative 2 over 3 times the quantity 3 plus h. Now we can let h get close to 0 by letting it equal 0, and the slope of the tangent line is equal to negative 2 ninths. Finally, we want the equation of the tangent line at x is equal to 2. We have the point, which is 2 2 thirds. We have our slope, which is negative 2 ninths. So by the point slope formula, y minus 2 thirds equals negative 2 ninths times the quantity x minus 2. Best to simplify this by multiplying everything by 9 and getting 9y minus 6 is equal to negative 2x plus 4. Solving for y, we get negative 2x plus 10 all over 9. And we see the calculator um, solution at the bottom where it appears to be tangent to the curve at x is equal to 2. Congratulations, you're doing some calculus. But even though this may look complicated, please remember that the only calculus involved is in step B, finding the equation of a tangent line. Finding the equation of secant lines you've done through pre-calculus, as well as finding equations of lines using the point-slope formula. The only thing new is finding the slope of a tangent line and we will find that there are better methods to do this further in the course. We created an analogy that linked the average velocity and instantaneous velocity to the concept of the average rate of change and the instantaneous rate of change. So, there are two formulas that we need to know. Given s of t as the distance traveled in time t, we then calculate the average velocity between t sub 1 and t sub 2. This is given by the formula average velocity equals s of t sub 2 minus s of t sub 1 over t sub 2 minus t sub 1. It is like the m secant formula and we have the instantaneous velocity at t sub 1. And this is given by the instantaneous velocity is s of t sub 1 plus h minus s of t sub 1 all over h as h gets infinitely close to 0. This corresponds to the formula for the instantaneous rate of change. Let's let our distance traveled formula, s of t equal 3t plus 1, where t is measured in seconds and s of t is measured in feet. Then the average velocity between 
time equals 0 and time equals 3 seconds is s of 3 minus s of 0 over 3 minus 0. That gives 10 minus 1 over 3, and it's 3 feet per second. So between time equals 0 and time equals 3, we're averaging 3 feet per second. The instantaneous velocity at time t equals 2 is given by s of 2 plus h minus s of 2 over h. And this ends up giving 3 quantity 2 plus h plus 1 minus 7 all over h, or 3h over h. As we saw before, the h's cancel, and we are left with 3 feet per second. So at time equals 2, the instantaneous velocity is 3 feet per second. In a car, when over a period of time, the average velocity is equal to the instantaneous velocity at some point in between those two times. We call that cruise control. In problem 8, we are given s of t equals t squared plus 2t. Again, t in seconds, s of t in feet. So the average velocity between time equals 0 and time equals 2 seconds is s of 2 minus s of 0 over 2 minus 0. And this ends up being 0 feet per second. For an average velocity to be 0 feet per second, it could be that the object is not moving. It could also mean that over a period of time the object is moving forward and then maybe moving backwards. We will study this phenomenon later. The instantaneous velocity, though, at t equals 2 seconds, is s of 2 plus h minus s of 2 all over h. And this gives 2 plus h quantity squared minus 2 times 2 plus h minus 0 over h. When we expand the expression and then factor it, we get h times 2 plus h over h. As before, the h's cancel, and we're interested in the expression 2 plus h as h gets close to 0. And therefore, the instantaneous velocity at time equals 2 seconds is 2 feet per second. Finally, we have s of t equals t cubed plus t squared minus t minus 1. Again, t in seconds and s of t in feet. We first want to calculate the average velocity between t equals 1 second and t equals 2 seconds. So that is s of 2 minus s of 1 over 2 minus 1, and that comes down to 9 feet per second. We also want the instantaneous velocity at t equals 1, which is s of 1 plus h minus s of 1 all over h. This gives 1 plus h quantity q plus 1 plus h quantity squared minus 1 quantity 1 plus h minus 1 minus 0 all over h. There's a lot of algebra that is not shown there. However, we end up with an expression ends up in the numerator that is factorable into h times the quantity 4 plus 4h plus 4h squared. And since that is over h, the h's cancel, and we're left with 4 plus 4h plus 4h squared as h gets close to 0. So the instantaneous velocity at t equals 1 second is 4 feet per second.